Hi, I'm Bob Orr, and this is Washington Unplugged. President Obama is spending much of this week behind closed doors speaking with cabinet members, with military officials, and also members of Congress about the road ahead in Afghanistan and also Pakistan. Specifically, the president's weighing a request from General Stanley McChrystal for more troops against some strong resistance from his own party. Joining me today to talk about this is Chief of Foreign Affairs Correspondent Lara Logan. Lara, we'll talk in just a second. First, though, I want to take a look at a comment we got this morning from Congressman Buck McKean. He's the ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee, and he's talking about a July conversation he had with Defense Secretary Gates, in which the secretary indicated at that time that the president may be reluctant to put more troops on the ground. We had a nice visit. One of the things that came up during that visit is he indicated that the president uh, was not inclined to send more troops. He, I don't know where he got that. It might have been there was a, a quote in the paper that General Jones, the national security advisor, had said that. It was public information. And uh, as a result of that, he said that he had asked uh, General Petraeus and General McChrystal to make sure that they scrubbed everything, that they didn't ask for more than what they needed, and that he would also scrub it before he sent it on to the president, just to make sure that that he was really thorough in his plan and that he was asking for what was really necessary to carry out the president's strategy. That was a conversation in July. Now, Larry, you were just there a few weeks ago. What is the situation on the ground? How urgently do these fellows need more help? Very urgently. I mean, it's General McChrystal has been very clear uh, that he, there is a very short window here probably 12 months in which you have to turn this around. It takes time to get more troops on the ground. They really can't afford to deliberate for very long on this. And that is being compounded by the fact that you have an unstable government situation in Kabul right now with you know the, the outcome of the election still undecided. So those two things make it increasingly urgent to get the troops on the ground and stop the momentum Right now, everyone agrees the momentum is on the side of the insurgents and the terrorists. What does that mean? It doesn't mean they're winning. It doesn't mean every time that there's a battle that, that they win. What it means is that the public perception, the flow, the increase in insecurity, everything is on their side right now. It's going the way they want it to, and that is what McChrystal has to stop. General McChrystal initially said he wanted to uh, reassure the people, help the people there have a better existence, uh, kind of prop them up, if you will. But it seems like that's getting sidetracked now by the attacks they need to fend off and all of the things that are happening with the insurgents. I don't think it's getting sidetracked. I think he's absolutely clear on that. He came into a situation where he found there was a lot of anger amongst the Afghan government and the Afghan people because of civilian casualties. It's also a situation where Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are very effectively using civilian casualties in their propaganda against the U.S. And he had to address that. He did that by adjusting his whole strategy. He knows he has to focus on securing the population. There's no question. He has to do that to bring the Afghan people with him. But at the same time, he is still fighting a war. Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are clearly at war with the U.S. They're not concerned with counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, call it whatever you like. They are at war, and McChrystal has to fight that war. And to do that, he has to have troops to secure the people and also not to give up ground to the enemy, which is what they're going to do if they withdraw from these small combat outposts in the remote areas. They're going to say, here, have the mountains, have the valleys, have all these places that are hard to get to. Oh, where, by the way, there aren't huge numbers of Afghans, but there are many Afghans scattered across these remote areas. And oh, yes, as well, that's where Al-Qaeda had their training camps before. So let's let them come back in, you know, and plot more attacks and do whatever they want in those remote areas while we concentrate on building schools and roads that are just going to get blown up. It doesn't work. You have to fight the war as well. You can't just do counterinsurgency. So if the reports are accurate, the general wants up to 40,000 troops. The troops over there know they need help. Now oh, the yes. president's weighing this. If you're a soldier over there, the White House comes back and says, we're not going to give the general what he wants, hypothetically, if they did that. How tough is that to swallow? Well, that's very tough to swallow. I mean, particularly for the commanders. At the soldier level, you know, they've got their small patch of ground. They're doing everything they can. Their expectations are low. They've done this war. I mean, let's face it, this is the starvation diet. It has been from day one. They've, the U.S. soldier in Afghanistan has done this war from the very beginning with very little resources. When I was in Iraq going to huge mess halls, defects, where you could get, you know, feeding thousands of troops and you had your choice of about 15 different things on the menu, I was going into bases in Afghanistan where they were still eating 
tea rats and MREs, which are basically, you know, not even one hot meal a day at that time. This has been the poor man's war from the start. So their expectations are low, but it's very clear to the soldiers on the ground that they need more help. And I think the only thing that they can take heart from at the moment is the fact that no quick decision is being rushed through, that this is a commander in chief who wants to do the right thing. Whether they'll agree with the decision in the end is obviously we don't know that, but at least they know that he's not taking this lightly. And, and that means he's not taking their lives and their sacrifices lightly. Now, the other side of more troops is what they call the counter-terrorist option. Vice President Biden and others are saying, let's concentrate on hitting al-Qaeda and the yeah. Taliban. Disaster. Why wouldn't that work? Absolute disaster. Why? There's no way it would work. Because you can't do any of those things if you have no security in most of the country. And, and let's not forget, the violence now has spread from the south and the east of Afghanistan. It's in the north. It's in the west. It's everywhere. It's in the provinces surrounding Kabul. I mean, it's like, what kind of a wake-up call do you need to say that you're still at war? And, and so this idea that you can separate the things is just ludicrous. That's why I think General McChrystal has gone and made everybody angry by so at his uh, speech in London saying, this is what I need and nothing else is going to work. Because you know what? You can be asked to give 10 options. But if you know that only one of them is going to work, only one's going to work. And even then, he's not guaranteeing that that's going to work. You know, so I don't understand why no one would listen to the, the man you put your faith in and said he's the guy who's going to do this for us. You've got to give him what he wants. Uh, President Obama, has, he has to weigh that against his other problem, which is what does Congress want? What do the American people want? But he has to make those two things work together. That's his challenge right now. And let me ask you this. If they go with a counter-terrorist option, they just use predators in the tribal areas against al-Qaeda, and they cede Afghanistan, back to the Taliban. Does al-Qaeda then find safe haven again in Af of Afghanistan? Of course, without hesitation. And you know, one very important point to make, there are a lot of Pashtun apologists out there, Taliban apologists, who are ad advisors to this um, White House and to this administration. And they're saying, oh, you know, the Taliban's fight is not with the U.S. If you, you know, you give them power, you bring back the moderate Taliban and everything will be okay. It's nonsense. It's the worst advice we could ever get from anyone. First of all, the Taliban have no intention of sharing power, and they have every intention of bringing al-Qaeda along with them and giving al-Qaeda safe haven again. They absolutely do have a problem with the U.S. They want to see the U.S. fail. Very important to note that talks with moderate Taliban have been going on since 2003. It's 2009, six years later. What have those negotiations and talks brought? absolutely nothing. So th that is one of the biggest lies ever of this whole situation right now. There are no t moderate Taliban that matter in this fight. And for the U.S. to give al-Qaeda the victory, I mean the philosophical victory, the physical victory, the tactical victory on every single level would be catastrophic in the war on terror. It would be a recruiting, uh, uh, you know, the greatest recruiting advertisement ever for al-Qaeda. And on top of that, you're leaving their their top leadership intact. You're leaving Osama bin Laden there to come back and, to, and do what he wants. You're leaving Ayman al-Zawahiri, his number two, and the head of the Taliban, you know, who are all in bed together. I mean, it's like, come on. The Afghan intelligence minister put it best when he said to me, there's no glory in defeat. Very tough spot for the president. Very. Lara, thanks very much. Thank you, Bob. Turning now to politics and pros, former presidential candidate and consumer advocate Ralph Nader is here with me this afternoon to discuss a brand new book that he's written. Very interesting title, and there's a picture of the cover, Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. Mr. Nader, thanks for coming by. Thank you, Bob. What is this about? And I will confess to you up front, I haven't read right. it. I've read excerpts and I've read some reviews, but tell me what you think this is about. Well, it's in the tradition of practical utopian fiction, and it's, uh, it basically asks the question, what if 17 or so enlightened older super rich Americans uh, decided they wanted to represent the interests of the people and take on the big corporations and their allies in Washington and all the money in politics, what would happen? So I put them in 2006, they meet in a mountain top motel, hotel in Maui, Hawaii, led by Warren Buffett, their Ted Turner and uh, Barry Diller and uh, George Soros and others. I mean, they're people in you fictional roles. You use real people, role, but right, in a fictional roles. In role. fictional roles. And they, they decide, uh, here's what we have to do uh, to get the necessities of the American people respected and established, health care and living wage and, you know, cor 
corporate accountability and clean elections, and they do it in a whole variety of exciting ways. Leslie Stahl actually took this book on her vacation in August, wrote me a nice letter saying that she found it engrossing, creative, and funny. And I said, I'll take all three, because it, it, it's a serious book, but it's easy reading, and it, it's a thriller, in effect. Now, the book, I think, starts, and you can correct me if I'm yeah. wrong here, Warren Buffett goes to New Orleans. Yeah. And, and he sees the devastation of Katrina. Exactly. And he concludes, this isn't working. We're not doing enough. Yeah, it represents the collapse of any kind of national organization to rescue people in a massive disaster. And he brings a convoy of supplies and public health workers and helps people on the highway, stranded families and children. And he goes back, and, and the grandmother grabs him by the hand and says, only the super rich can save us. And this haunts him all the way back to Omaha on the highway. And that's when he decides to get these 16 other super rich people who have enlightened uh, enlightened uh, activities, and they're in their latter years, in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, when they want to move, as one of them said, from material success to significance. You have some interesting characters, though, in yeah. addition to the ones you've mentioned. You mentioned Ted Turner, I think. Yeah. Warren Beatty's in the book? Yeah, he's running against Schwarzenegger in the election of 2006. And he is a prototypical example of how to, how to weave together conservative and liberal people and win an election. And Yoko Ono. She's the artistic the and moral sentiments. And uh, all they're trying to get huge rallies in the center cities all over the country. And, and you know, so they use music, food, and art. art. And she contributes that. A beautiful seventh generation logo becomes known by almost everybody in the country as the activities of these people uh, pervade the mass media and mobilize the community. They, this is a top down, bottom up change process. And they'll call it the, the Titanic battle ends up in Congress near the end. But it's all the different ways. Uh, people will feel stronger as, as citizens. They'll get a real imaginative lift. We don't imagine enough. We're stuck in traffic in this country. Gridlock in Washington, corruption, bailouts in Wall Street, the economy sinking. People are depressed. They're discouraged. It's time for them to envision what's possible. And you can do it with fiction, actually better with, than nonfiction. What do you want people to get from it? Do you want them to be entertained or informed? Do you want to provoke some thinking? What's, what's the goal? I want them to, to be fascinated enough to elevate their imagination toward real possibilities. And, and the key thing is this, that every time citizen groups want to get a fair break for the American people, they, they don't have the resources. There's, now there isn't even one lobbyist pushing single payer on Capitol Hill. And there are 2,000 lobbyists for the drug insurance and hospital chains doing it on Capitol Hill. See, it's that mismatch that this book corrects, because these super rich people put about $15 billion into this national strategy, national, local community. And suddenly people say, you know, uh, maybe it is just a matter of money. Maybe it is a matter of resources to hire the organizers and to get the media, media and to, and to uh, put the pressure from the grassroots with Congress watchdog groups on members of Congress. We never talk about that. You know, uh, look what the athletes are getting today compared to when we were children. Look what how size of the foundations. Look at the executive compensation packages. They're all up like by exponential rates. But the citizen movements are still starving. And here I, I think, and I don't think we should think all super rich people are, are selfish and myopic. When they, they, there are some who are very enlightened, and there are some in their advanced stage who want to really uh, bring this country back. They don't want to leave this country uh, of theirs in a decaying uh, state. Let me ask you, the, the book has some big Ralph Nader ideas, yes. things that we've heard before, yes. things before. Yes. I mean, one of the things you mentioned, I think, is Walmart is unionized. Yes. Right. By, by Saul Price, who's one of the 17, <laughs> he's the founder of the big box industry. Okay, but you have uh, more regulation, you have the yeah. rich people paying a bigger share, yeah. the little guy wins in some... What makes you think people will, will take these ideas any more seriously or any more to heart than they yeah. have? I mean, you've been out with these yeah, ideas yeah. for a long time. It's a very, very good question because the dialogue uh, tries to bring in conservatives. And in the discussion in the White House, and discussion in Congress, the discussion among the CEOs, there's a fascinating dialogue that establishes that on many areas, uh, privacy, uh, uh, sovereignty, uh, against corporate bailouts, uh, 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 against waste in government, against deficits, conservatives and liberals are like this. And that's one way that's they succeed. That's why you succeeded. call it utopia. Yeah, well, that's what, yeah. a practical <laughs> utopia. And they go into the American Legion, VFW, Elks, Kiwanis Clubs, all these lecturers. Look, it's a real lesson in if we don't expand our imagination,
toward real possibilities that we're capable of in this country, our reach will not expand and our grasp will not expand. It's an interesting idea. Ralph Nader, thanks very much. Only the super rich can save us. In your bookstores today. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bill. And thanks to you for watching Washington Unplugged today. Of course, you can find us here every day at cbsnews.com at 1230 p.m. I'm Bob Orr. Have a great day.